Welcome back. How shocking is it? We are doing this next video less than seven days since the last video. So if you were shocked by that, go ahead and drop a like down below. So what are we getting into today? Today we're going to get into cork and um, some of my theories on how I use cork, you know, the way I think about it and the different types that I keep in my shop. I'm sure if you've seen my work in the past, you've probably seen a lot more inlay stuff where I was doing a lot of, you know, adding of color and layers and not just natural stuff. And I've kind of got away from that because I do a lot more small water stuff. I do a lot more really lightweight rods for purpose built stuff. So I'm going to take you through, I'm going to show you all that stuff and the types that are generally laying around here. And then at the end of the video, I'm going to explain to you what's been allowing me to get back on an upload schedule and just some other little stuff. So I will see you at the end of this video. I'm not gonna interrupt this one, I promise. So as I said, we're gonna go over cork types and their uses and I have it laid out here from right to left in being natural cork with these two rings, smoked cork, burnt, burl, and this one's dyed kind of a light blue this one is referred to as premium burl, or sometimes I've seen it labeled as HD or particle. And particle is the more accurate representation of this one because all it really is is cork particle is cork scrap that is then bonded with an agent of color. And that's why it looks this way. And then finally composite or rubberized cork. So I have a couple examples sitting out and one's my emoji and the other one is this full inlaid second hand for a spay rod. I'll show you what my thought process is in selecting all these and also when is cork good and when is cork bad and there's quite a wide margin between good cork and bad cork. So let's get into that. I'm going to flip you around, take you in a little bit closer and we'll discuss each one. So let's start off with the natural cork like I had said. And this is a pretty good ring. This is a pretty decent ring. Both sides are Okay, this ring is a little bit more questionable because it has a lot of dark spotting in it. This is a ring that in no way can I use this. There's big holes through it everywhere, and these are probably carrying through. So when I would get to those points, I'd have those big black lines in the cork. So this would be rejected. This ring is even worse. You could see it is just littered with them. It has black spotting, and again, it carries through. So that is my first check down. So like this ring where it's at right here with that spot, um, I may or may not turn this ring down or I may put it on the front end. And if it doesn't work, I can chop that ring out. This ring has a lot of staining going through it as well. You can see it running through, but it's fairly clean. I would probably take a shot with that. This ring, there's no open pits to it either side there's no discoloration so that's a pretty good ring so what i do with cork initially is a visual inspection but from that visual inspection i'm probably looking at about 200 rings and then i'll regrade everything and about 15 percent is going to end up here where it, it's just in a no-fly zone i can't use this then you're going to end up with stuff that is kind of on the border which is probably another 20 percent the mid-range of about 50% is going to fall somewhere into this category where it's probably more usable. And then 15% is going to be the upper tier that is really, really clean. So I'll just grab a couple of Ziploc bags. I'll go through and I'll resort everything. So that's just a visual inspection. And the other thing that you could do is density is really important. The, the denser the cork, the better off you're going to be. So you can see 
you can just almost fingernail test it and see how easy it is to mark and just use that feedback from your hand. And I know a guy who actually goes through and he sorts his cork on density and he puts the most dense rings towards the front where the most pressure is applied with your hand. And at the rear, he might use something a little bit softer. So, and you end up with less waste that way. So, I mean, if you look at it, these are probably dollar and a quarter rings. Everything else is probably, I mean, these are three and a half, four dollars retail. And perfect cork is probably, in my eyes, about six dollars a ring. Factor that into a six inch handle, which is 12 rings. You're talking $72 worth of cork, even before you start turning it. So what I did here was I grabbed my two emojis, my one that's been fished for about three and a half years versus the one that's being built up. And you can see these two cork grades started out at about the same grade. And you can see how it's going to wear. All cork is going to wear and these pits are going to open up due to the cellular nature of cork. This is inevitable. Even the most perfect cork that you can buy, it's all going to weather over time. It's just how quick does it go? And that's more of a reflection on the density. You probably also noticed that I have this sitting out and all my cork is not bored. So I buy all my cork on board because I will stick it in this jig and this jig goes in my one small mill and I bore all my own cork. And the reason why I do this is I drill everything to the nominal front edge diameter of the blank so that I don't have to taper bore as much. And for instance, like these are both three weights. And you can see the difference. This blank diameter is under a quarter inch and this blank diameter is about five sixteenths at the front edge. So all cork is typically bored at quarter I would have to arbor this out so I can drill this out to my nominal diameter and know that everything fits tight. That's why I buy it that way. And I can also drill it more concentric from the get go and waste less cork. So now we're going to get into my two favorite types of rings to make check rings out of. And you can see the check rings in this handle. And the thing that's really nice about this stuff is it's just natural cork that's been heat treated. So one is burnt and one is just smoked. The only issue you run into with this cork, and you can see it right here sometime, is there will be little pockets and pits in it. But it generally doesn't run throughout. And as long as you take the time to sort through it, it's usually pretty good. Um, the only downside to this and then I'll give you one more upside, is it smells so bad when you turn it. You could smell that it's been treated with heat and the cork has been adversely affected by it. But the nice thing is this stuff turns just like natural cork. So you're not going to end up with the humps and bumps whenever you're trying to transition between dissimilar grades and you're sanding everything in the final shape. So it's really easy to use. It's really nice to use. And just... For the hell of it, I brought out the jigs for that I use for cutting um, all my check rings and stuff. And that's where the jeweler saw came from in the last episode. So that's the smoke and that's the burnt. We're going to move on now to the two different types of burl cork. So moving into the burls, I have both types of burl laid out here. I have the natural burl cork and then I have this composite burl cork or premium burl which if you notice i mean the colors are a lot more vivid in this stuff than it is in this but when you look at it up close you could see the difference in the layers this one has the natural movement of a burl let's go color for color so you could see the difference between the two and it's not the same the thing that's nice, or the thing that you may find to be nice about this, is the color is more vivid than this. But my thing with cork, and my thing with my builds when I'm using cork, is I like to keep everything subdued. So in this one alone, this is brown burl. There's blue here, and there's blue here. And this is kind of like a minor focal point, so you're not going to notice this until you get up close. 
that's my choice. Um, as far as if you're trying to turn this stuff down for the first time, this behaves more like natural cork. This stuff is a lot more dense. This is where you have to be careful when you're coming up off of naturals and the smokes and the burnts and onto this stuff is you're going to end up with these humps and bumps in your transition because the hardness is way higher in this than it's going to be in this or this. So that's one thing to be aware of. And the other thing to be aware of is that I get a lot of people that want color in the back end of a rod. This stuff weighs way more than any natural cork you're going to use. So let's say it's 30% heavier, 30% is 30% more weight in the back end of a rod. And on a spay rod, you want to generate more weight out the back to make it balance better. But in a single hand rod that is small, adding this stuff to it is adding unnecessary weight. I think it also detracts away from what a small water rod should be and that's really simple and clean but some people like color just be aware of what you're getting into with these when you start to build that rod up another benefit i should say of using this is it is very high wear so you can put it in high wear areas for example this front hand of this spay this is where my hand is going to make contact this area is not going to want to wear as fast. So contact areas, yeah, use the burl. But be mindful that you are adding weight. And in a single hand rod, we're not trying to add weight. We're going to balance that with the reel usually. So we're on to the last type of cork that I'm going to talk about for this video. Even though there's other types of cork out there, this is what I keep around in my shop. And this is the rubberized cork or the composite cork. So where would this be used or where would I use it? And the only place where I use it is in the back of a secondhand rod, which you can see it both here and here, and in the back end of a fighting butt. And why is that where I use it? Well, this stuff is extremely wear resistant, which is good for a part of a rod that's going to be dug into the body. And it's very heavy, which is both good and bad. So very good when it's in the very back end of a rod it helps you out with balance very bad when it's used anywhere else and this stuff is the hardest to turn it does not like to flush in so for example getting this second hand to look smooth and flow I probably spent as much time getting this back end worked out as I did on the whole rest of the shape of this handle so that is the only reason why I would use this stuff. Um, it's just not very useful anywhere else. Maybe if you're building a boat rod in which the front end of the grip is going to be meeting with the boat, like a musky rod doing figure eights. Okay, I, I, I could see that working out. Um, the other thing is that rubberized stuff, it really sucks the moisture out of your hands badly. So I don't use it anywhere else. With that being said, we're nearly done here. We're going to wrap this up. I will see you flipped around and we'll uh, close it out. All right. Well, that pretty much does it. Um, if I missed anything, if there's more detail that you want on something, I just want this kind of be an overview of how I look at this stuff. And I know there's other types of cork out there. I mean, there's natural edge. There's all this other stuff that's out there. Um, I didn't want to get into that too much. But if there's something that I missed that you want to know, drop a comment down below and I'll get back to you on that. Um, yeah, that's about it for this video. Um, so why have I been able to upload quicker? Well, um, first of all, I do all the editing on these videos. And I've been compressed for time. And as I'm learning this new skill set, I think I do okay with photos. I've done photos long enough and I've edited enough photos to be comfortable. But this video thing is completely new to me. And I started out with a program that was very basic and allowed me to get done what I needed to do. It was called Filmora. I've since moved on to using Adobe Premiere and that opened up this whole new world to me where I can shoot all my video on multiple cameras of mine running flat. And then I can add a LUT pack to it and I have a lot better control. So I, I, I like 
control of image. And just like with a rod, this is allowing me to control the image of the video. And I think the videos are looking better. If you watched the last video, that was with Adobe Premiere. I've been trying to learn Adobe Premiere now for, I don't know, four months. So it's a lot to learn, but it's paying off. So if you like it, let me know. Um, I am out of time for now, and I appreciate the time that we have spent together. And as always, I will see you again soon. I may see you again in 30 days, or I may never see you again. Regardless, I appreciate this time that you've spent with me.